everybody. My name is Katherine Haley, and I am joined by my colleagues, Tori Bell, Pat Burke, and Mary Margaret. And uh, on behalf of the Philanthropy Roundtable, we're so grateful that you would take some time to be with us. I'm pleased to welcome Eva Moskowitz, the CEO and founder of Success Academies, and Susie Kovner, who is a former board member and Simon Prize winner of the Philanthropy Roundtable. She also serves on the board of Success Academies. But before we begin our, um, our conversation, uh, I just want to give some, a few housekeeping items. We will be sending a follow-up email after this conversation with some high notes and some key points that were covered today, as well as a link to the recording of the webinar. Um, Eva will be answering some questions toward the end of our conversation, so please be sure to use the Q&A feature uh, not the chat feature, the Q&A feature to pose your question, and we will get to that later today. Second, um, we have a variety of COVID-19 resources for, each, for you, hopefully to inspire your philanthropy and maybe provide some guidance. Please be sure to check our website, not only for those resources, but also for forthcoming gatherings. So with that, um, Susie, thank you so much for making time for, to be with us. You've known Eva, for a long time, and you're an active board member as the vice chair of the board. Um, thank you for giving some of your time to uh, allow us for this great conversation. Well, two of my favorite organizations, the Philanthropy Roundtable and, of course, Success Academy, and our fearless leader, if, if she has an hour, I do too. So we're, uh, I'm looking forward to sharing uh, a great conversation and learning a lot in the next, uh, in the next few minutes. So thank you. So uh, let's jump right in. We've got 20 minutes until we open it up for questions, Eva. So would you start with giving us an overview, not only of Success Academy, but how you prepared for COVID-19 and transition to online learning? Sure, and, and thank you, Susie and, and Catherine and the Philanthropy Roundtable for having me. Uh, you know, New York is the epicenter epicenter of the pandemic and it's been a really really difficult time uh, not only for New York City but our poorest children are the most vulnerable and we at Success Academy serve the poorest of the poor and so it's been very very challenging um, we have always said you know look we're not medical doctors we're not economists we're not city planners we don't really control the you know, larger universe, what we do know how to do is love kids and teach kids. So we're going to do everything in our power to make sure that our children have a consistent learning environment that is convenient and simple. So we were uh, the first school in New York City to close um, when New York City and New York State were saying, no, we're not going to close the schools. Um, and we stood up remote learning for 18,000 children, K to 12. Uh, now making it somewhat easier was that we had um, a fairly digitized environment. So our fourth through 12th graders had a one-to-one, -one. Um, but it was still sort of a tricky maneuver. And when I say remote learning, Susie, just so the audience understands, I don't mean sending parents links to worksheets that the kids can fill out. I mean, teachers online, uh, teaching reading, mathematics, even science, even project-based learning. And so kids are going to school. It's a little odd, uh, and I wouldn't say it's exactly the same uh, as having children in school, but every kindergartner in our network is now on a Zoom like this with 31 other children and their two teachers. Uh, getting a full instructional day. Uh, and that was a bit challenging to orchestrate in a short period of time. So can you describe a typical school day? What time do you start and uh, how, how does it proceed? How do the different grades get different, uh, have different experiences? And that's a really important point because um, kindergartners are different than 11th graders, so it does vary by school type. For middle school and for high school, we start the day with an advisory meeting. And our advisory model uses every adult in the building 
who advises somewhere between 10 and 15 children. Um, and that is always important in schooling, but in remote learning, kids really need to be focused and set up for success. So at those meetings, um, we're talking about the challenges that they are facing in their lives. Um, we're talking about social and emotional development. And we're also talking about time management and how they plan their day to get the work done. And that's for a half an hour every single day. And then uh, they start their classes. And different students have different classes at different times. So the calculus kids are, you know, logging onto their calculus class where their, you know, electrical engineering is a different class. And so um, last week, for example, uh, our blue jeans, uh, that's the Zoom device we use, we held 64,000 meetings. That was the sum total of all the different Zooms or video conferences that we did. Um, and the way it works is that one teacher is uh, teaching and we're able to put our absolute best teacher forward and other teachers are giving students feedback. And I know this is hard to believe depending on sort of what generation uh, you're in, but when our teachers are teaching, we can see the student work of all the kids in the class. And so I, as the teacher, can see uh, the struggling student who is not able to do the mathematics. And then I could call that student for a one-on-one -on -one conferencing. That is quite a um, uh, wedding to orchestrate the learning, uh, but our teachers are quite versatile in doing that kind of instruction. And does that one-on-one -on -one instruction come at the end of the day or at the end of the period? How do you squeeze that in to make sure the students are all keeping up? It's in the moment. So if I'm the lead teacher and I'm launching the lesson and you are not the lead teacher, we decide before the calculus class starts based on the student work on the night before who is struggling and who you're going to go to and do a five minute conference. And I name all together, we name the six to eight students that you're gonna go to one-on-one -on -one during, uh, not during the launch, but during the class work time. Amazing. Uh, with all of this talk about um, income inequality between the haves and the have nots in online learning, how did you make sure that all of your scholars had access to the internet? Well. Uh, and look, uh, there is a digital divide and it is quite serious. I think sometimes people are a little confused whether that is Wi-Fi access or a device. In New York City, at least, there is pretty widespread internet access. Um, and so among 18,000 children, we only had, you know, a dozen or so that needed hotspots. Um, there's also companies that have offered uh, free internet access in New York. I'm not speaking for other localities. Um, so that was not our main problem. Um, it was a little complicated. Um, we had to get email addresses for our kindergartners. And, you know, you mix up the letters and it doesn't let you to log in. <laughs> and so it did take um, a little bit of doing to get, and just so you understand, we have thousands of kindergartners. So we had to get all of those kids online. Um, but our biggest problem was not the Wi-Fi ac access issues. Um, kindergartners, we've discovered, like to show their noses on uh, video conferencing. So we had a little bit of you know, proper decorum for the VC for the little ones, but it's amazing how fast they, they learn. They are submitting their homework digitally. They are now logging on with their email address. I would advise when anyone uh, who is tall has a technological problem, they should find a short person and ask them how to do it because they're pretty agile. <laughs> and uh, Chromebooks, how many Chromebooks did you have to, after the email addresses, you had to give out Chromebooks 
uh, and uh, register them and uh, make sure that everybody understood how to use one. Tell, tell me what that was like. I, I heard the landing at Normandy was a challenge, but uh, this, this may have been extra challenging. It was extra challenging because New York is shut down. So you, you can't, and, and people were not allowed to be traveling freely. So we couldn't say to parents, come to the school building, pick up your Chrome tablet. Um, we distributed uh, for our K to three students where we didn't have a one-to-one -one program. Uh, we distributed uh, Chrome tablets, the cases and the styluses, and those had to be kitted together. And then we had to arrange uh, delivery. And so that was a little bit challenging. And, you know, truth be told, it didn't happen overnight. It took us several weeks, but we are now fully digital K to 12. Mm. Well, what, what a task. Um, and tell us what your student retention and attendance uh, has been like from the day that you went online to, to now. Sure, we have extraordinarily high attendance when we're in a bricks and mortar context and we have 97% daily attendance. Um, and I, I think it's confusing to people. Um, you know, New York City spent $269 million on tablets uh, and distributed them. Um, but often if you don't have a culture of learning and you don't have strong work habits, um, it, it would be very hard to do remote learning in the way we have done it. Um, our kids know that the expectation is if you're supposed to be somewhere at nine o'clock, you need to be there five minutes before nine o'clock. Um, we have a culture where um, students know that they have to hand in their assignments and frankly, if they don't have a good reason, uh, you know, if they're sick, of course, or they're uh, taking care of a family member, there are obviously um, uh, extraordinary circumstances, but we have a culture where learning and education and showing up and participating and being responsible for your work is part of our culture. And so transitioning to remote learning um, the expectations were there while being sensitive to the fact that we're in the middle of a pandemic and in the middle of a world economic shutdown, uh, which is very different than normal. But I don't think it works just to flip the switch if you didn't have that culture of excellence. And not only among the kids, but frankly, our teachers did not miss a beat. Our teachers understood that learning matters more now than ever, and that we are dependent on them to teach as if this was their last day of teaching and how to give it your all and make sure that every kid is progressing. So can you talk a little bit more about the curriculum that you developed and how you utilized your strongest teachers uh, for, for these lessons? Yeah, and look, I would want to make sure that our audience understands um, as good as our remote learning is, and I think it's really, really strong, it's not the same as being um, in the physical presence of students. And by the way, we miss them terribly, and hugs are important, and being able to, you know, walk a student around the hallway who's in a bad mood or experiencing some stress or trauma, you know, it's much, much harder to do it in this little rectangular box. But what we did is we said, okay, we're in the middle of a pandemic. What are our most important instructional priorities? Like if we can only do three things, what are the three things that really matter for kids and that are gonna prepare them for the next grade? Um, and we came back to really essential principles, reading. Reading is the most important thing. If we can only do one thing, our kids must read. And so we made sure that those digitized resources, that kids are still book shopping, that kids are still discussing books. Um, and we kind of simplified our curriculum so that we weren't um, trying to do, uh, you know, the perfect school in very imperfect conditions. 
and that we really simplified and got to the essence of what is important to us. And, you know, we, we had to change our curriculum to get there. We also had to change all of our assessments because once you change the content, you can't assess kids on content you're not still teaching. Um, but we did that really quickly to make sure that we were ready uh, for uh, kids. And your readership amongst your scholars went up uh, incredibly in the first week, right? The first week they were home. We uh, went through uh, all of the remaining audible credits for the rest of the year in the first week. And we had to replenish our uh, supplies. We view that as a really good problem to have. And so we were happy to have kids reading more. I think I interrupted you though. You were talking about the three essential things. You started with reading and then yes. I got well, uh, yeah. Mathematics is, um, but it wasn't just, of course, mathematics is important, but we went through kind of um, not only the grade that the kids are in, but we looked at the following grade and we said, what are the essential big ideas mathematically that a kid in fourth grade is going to need not only to finish out the year, but to be ready for fifth grade because um, the content is related. And so we focused on those key ideas and we redid our curriculum to prioritize those big ideas. And we did that in history, we did it in science, we did it in mathematics, and of course in reading. It's amazing. Um, can you talk about the letter that you sent Success Academy families about uh, maintaining grading and accountability um, and how your system will differ from the New York uh, Department of Education system? Well, you know, I was pondering this and it, it's, it's a little bit of a delicate um, balance where you say to yourself, okay, we're in a fundamentally new context and we can't pretend that we're not in the middle of a pandemic or economic, uh, you know, uh, shutdown. On the other hand, we've had two thirds of the school year and we do want to make sure that the kids are learning. And so I'm reading about San Francisco giving every single student an A. Then Seattle followed suit. And I, I just did not agree with that approach approach, um, it's not because the grades themselves are so, so important, but you do want um, everyone to be accountable and you want to know, students and parents need to know, did the kid master? Did we teach them appropriately? And so what we did is we looked at our uh, old grading system and we said, given that we're in the midst of a pandemic, do we want the standard to be quite as high? So for us, passing is 70% because we're rigorous people and we think kids need to meet a high mark, but we lowered it to 65 because the context has changed. We also changed the actual assessments to mirror and be aligned to the changes in content, but we're all still accountable. I'm accountable as CEO to the board Principals are accountable, teachers are accountable, and kids and families are accountable. And we didn't want to just sort of give up. To me, that would be giving up on learning. And the world isn't going to stop. It's not like fifth grade is going to reorganize all of the content and teach fourth grade. And so we wanted the kids to be prepared for the next grade. Mm. Very sound. Um, so let me ask you um, how you're sharing that curriculum uh, and how are you using your uh, strongest teachers? Well, great. Um, and I realized I didn't answer your question about the strongest teachers and that, that's a really good point. The other exercise we went through in addition to simplifying, getting to the essence, making sure it was workable for kids and families given the context is we did think remote learning was possibly an opportunity to reallocate resources more efficiently and effectively. And given that um, learning was not in person, we quickly looked at 
um, specialization and who could do what. And, you know, there are differences in teachers and teaching. So, for example, in seventh grade, we certainly recognized that we had uh, an outstanding seventh grade math teacher. And rather than treating everybody the same, we said, let's let that most outstanding seventh grade math teacher launch the lesson and do the discourse at the end. And let's let less experienced teachers um, do tutoring, do small group instruction, as long as we had the luxury of not having four brick and mortar walls, let's really think about the resource allocation. And so we kind of redesigned the school rather quickly in order to maximize um, every educator's role. Um, so that's what we did. Well, that's clever. It also allows the, um, the newer teachers to learn from the uh, more seasoned ones. So it's a, it's a great plan. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how the um, Ed Institute is uh, providing um, some of your lessons curriculum and how you're sharing it? Yeah, and, and you know, we've been really, really fortunate uh, that um, from, you know, quite some number of years ago, we were committed to sharing uh, our intellectual property and any discoveries we have made. We don't think we have all the answers by any means, but we do think that we have some answers to some of the most vexing problems of education. And so for quite some time through the Ed Institute, which is like a sort of school for schoolers, if you will, it's a, a vehicle for uh, sharing best practices as well as training our internal people, we have put all of our K4 literacy uh, for the world to see. We've run workshops on our project-based learning. Uh, we put our middle school mathematics uh, online for everyone to see. But in the context of a pandemic, given that we uh, kind of figured out a way of doing remote learning, we wanted to share much more quickly because it wouldn't really be valuable if it took us two months to share. So literally the same week we decided to close and turn on the remote learning switch, we put out uh, our remote learning plan um, and we had 2000 educators from around the country logging on, asking questions. We've done a lot of them that are a little more local uh, for educators in Boston and educators in Washington, DC, et cetera. Um, we also have put out all of our K-2 remote learning. Those are weekly schedules. Um, those are materials that t our teachers receive, materials parents receive, and of course the content and curriculum, uh, just to make it easier for people who are struggling to figure out how to do this. That's great, you're, you're lifting all boats, uh, at least those who uh, take advantage of the Ed Institute, so that's wonderful. Um, let me ask you a question. With uh, Dr. Fauci's uh, warning yesterday that we will be entering the fall with no vaccine and the emergence of the Kawasaki uh, infections, how are you weighing reopening versus online learning? And I, I don't mean to pressure you right now, this is not a board meeting, but I, I, we, I think some of us would love to hear your thoughts on how you're making these decisions. Sure, and, and look, um, uh, I had a, uh, a map of all my risks and pandemic wasn't on there. Uh, and so I don't want to pretend to be any more experienced than I am. But, you know, uh, the safety and health concerns are of the utmost priority for our families, but also for the health system. Uh, but so, too, is reopening the economy. And so um, the way we are thinking about it is we want to go back as soon as it is safe to do so. Understanding that, you know, we don't live in a zero risk world. Um, we wanna make sure that we take all the smart steps to protect safety and health. And we're gonna have to be guided by government. 
on when that point is, but we are planning on uh, going back when our school year starts pending government approval. And we are planning for going back normally. I doubt that is gonna happen, but that we're planning for that, going back in a hybrid mode or being remote. But what we can't do is throw up our hands, particularly for our most vulnerable children. And so we are going to ensure that our kids have an uninterrupted uh, education uh, one way or another. And those are you know, three different scenarios that require enormous logistical executional competence. Um, but we're gonna figure out a way. I keep telling my team, uh, society put a man on the moon, we should be able to figure out these three scenarios. And I do think it's really important in these times um, to have a can-do attitude. Like it's not gonna be perfect and we obviously have to be super mindful of health and safety, but we've got to be optimistic and we've got to find a way to get it done as smartly as humanly possible. Well, you're such a brilliant leader, Eva. Uh, we will be looking for the announcement. Um, we're almost out of time for our part of the um, segment, but I just wanted to ask you, can you make it a little bit more personal and tell us, have any of the scholars uh, contracted the virus and tell us about your families and if you could just throw in uh, how the first thing you had to do was figure out how to feed your scholars who were no longer going to school. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't want the picture of remote learning, which is going well to in any way sugarcoat um, the pain and the difficulty. We have had students who are positive. Um, we've lost uh, about 40 parents and caretakers and grandparents since we've opened. And it's really, really challenging to do what we would normally do, which is plan the funeral. There are no funerals in New York. Um, it's been hard on the kids, our teachers who love the kids. It gets you into the foster care system because those kids need to be supported and provided for. Um, you know, we have, um, have teenagers who are having to work, you know, as checkout uh, personnel because their parents don't have any income. You know, it has not been easy for our kids and families. Um, and, you know, in these difficult times, we have had to send uh, grocery gift certificates to families so that they can shop and get something to eat. Um, we have had to, you know, call on government to advocate for our children and families because they don't have a prescription and the health, public health care system isn't delivering for one reason or another, given what's going on. Um, but, you know, we have done that advocating and sort of constituent services, if you will, because our families and kids are in need and we've promised not just to deliver for them when there's no pandemic, but we've promised uh, through thick or thin, we're gonna deliver for children and families. And so it has been, uh, you know, kind of strain on the network because those are services that we wouldn't have to provide quite so quickly and voluminously that we have to provide in the middle of all that's going on. Mm. Well, thank you for your thoughtfulness and uh, again, for making tough decisions and taking care of our scholars and their families. And Catherine, I apologize. I didn't even let you, you know, edge in with a question. So please, if you want to take it from this uh, very serious note to something a little lighter or more <laughs> cheerful, let's talk about school. Uh, please do. <laughs> well, just say there's a, a couple questions is, what do you feel like hasn't gone right? Well, I mean, I, I, a pretty good picture, but what do you feel like has not gone right? Yeah, I think where we have struggled is probably our 10% um, most disinvested kids and families. Um, our tactics uh, in remote are not as effective as we would like. And that doesn't mean we're giving up, uh, but it 
it's discouraging because those are the kids who need the most support. And it's not, I think people think it's the kids who academically struggle and um, that's challenging, but I think it's the kids who struggle with um, home life and family conflict and there's just a lot going on in their lives. Uh, and those kids are harder to reach when they don't come to school every day. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we're trying and we do, you know, our uh, counselors uh, are on deck and working very hard. Um, but I think people forget that one aspect of schooling is really uh, changing the mood or setting the mood or uplifting the mood. I'm so taken, Catherine, by the flowers behind you. I said when we came on, they're so cheerful. You don't must forget you're in a pandemic. And I view schooling that way. Like we're supposed to bring the beautiful flowers. Um, we have a smile on our face, no matter whether it's raining out or not. And kids really need that. They need the adults to be optimistic, loving, Tomorrow is going to be a better day. If the morning is not good, the afternoon is going to be great. And it's harder to do that when the kids are not in front of you. And I know of no group of educators who work harder than SA educators at flipping the mood, keeping the mood up, changing the mood. But it's just not so easy for some percentage of our kids. Right. How do you guys, in the event that a student doesn't log on, or in the example that you gave earlier of a, a young teenager who has to go work at the locally, local grocery store to bring an income in the family, like how do you guys account for uh, someone not logging on or participating in class? How does that work? Well, we're, we're sort of very on it. So if you are not logging on, uh, we call you, we text you, we call your mother, we call your father, we call your second cousin twice removed. Um, and we, you know, we're pretty aggressive about this is your priority unless there's another priority, which sometimes there is. And then we say, okay, we get it you had to get this job. So we're going to make sure that the session is recorded. You know, we're going to have, you have office hours. All of our teachers have office hours. So if you miss something, it's still your responsibility to take advantage of the office hours. Um, but we do have to be accommodating for all the different circumstances. If you are a single mother and you have three children and you're trying to feed your family and you've, you're, you know, you you live with a second family, it's a little hard to focus. And so some of our normal policies about late assignments, we have to be much more generous and empathetic. Um, if families are in contact with us, we're very, very accommodating. Where we get less accommodating is if they don't give us a heads up that there's some problem and when we will get the assignment or when we can sit down with your child to make sure that they've um, are exposed to the material, it gets a little harder. That makes sense. A few, um, there's so many different questions that folks have posted on, posted. Um, regarding, um, talking about the, your youngest learners, there was a, some questions about, um, for young students that were K through two, K through three, how much did you have to engage the parent in order to get those students um, and scholars sort of online and sort of ready to learn? Um, I know you mentioned that give a kindergartner a device and they can help you uh, navigate sort of this technological divide, but how, like, how were parent? How much did parents have to be involved in their? children's learning, specifically for your youngest learners. Yeah, and, and I wouldn't want to mislead you. They, they do have to, you know, sign for the delivery and uh, kind of help set it up. And we did a lot of webinars with parents. I personally did them uh, with some of my staff where um, we took the parents of kindergartners through the instructions of how to set up the device. You should know that we loaded them all remotely. So they were not putting any apps on it. We did as much remote 
uh, as was humanly possible, but just so parents felt comfortable and not intimidated by the device, um, mm -hmm. did a series of webinars. We also did a series of webinars on what remote learning was going to look like, both pre-Chrome tablets and post-Chrome tablets. And believe it or not, and it's uh, pretty remarkable, before we had Chrome tablets, we had parents sign up for the learning time that worked best for them. So initially we were doing uh, individual learning because we didn't have the devices. So that was either through the teacher's phone or FaceTiming the kid on the parent's phone. And we said to each parent, we're gonna have instruction for two and a half hours a day. You tell us what works best for you. And that was um, a pain in the neck, frankly, but it meant that we had a lot of buy-in because our parents were saying, oh my God, the school is accommodating my crazy schedule. And they're not just sort of my way or the highway. Once we moved over to Chrome tablets, it was a little easier because frankly, the five-year-olds are now logging on. They know that from 9.30 to 10, they have a guided reading group and then they have a half hour break. And then from you know, 10.30 to 11, they have a small group uh, for mathematics and then they have writing um, and the kids uh, parents were actually surprised. Uh, sometimes parents think their kids uh, can't function independently, but of course, when you run schools, you have to have some level of autonomous learning. So we were very explicit. The first few days, teachers went over the routines with the kids, how they're going to self-pace, how they're going to know what time it is, how much time they have off, you know, that that's the time to get a snack, that's the time to go to the bathroom. We had many, many breaks in between. And by the way, our scholar talent teachers had some optional activities. So if you were off between 10 and 10.30, you could uh, join the soccer class. Our soccer teachers uh, led classes where you were kicking a roll of toilet paper, I kid you not. And, uh, how many times could you kick that roll of toilet paper up in the air? Our teachers got really, really creative. And there were a whole bunch of optional VCs that the kids could join. Um, you know, we also did, uh, we did uh, digital field trips. So we have a bird study unit in second grade and our kids are doing virtual field trips. Uh, we're doing the Arctic in first grade and we were uh, on a tear to find a polar bear uh, that uh, the kids could watch. And the San Diego Zoo uh, has a polar bear and they helped us out. And so the kids are uh, able to do their learning uh, that way. And if you make it engaging enough, uh, the littlest learners are, they find that more fun than frankly sitting home and twiddling their thumbs. Are there other uh, the act optional activities? I mean, is it sort of math, reading, science, history? You might have a 30 minute break. You can take soccer, or go on the digital field trip, but are there other um, learning opportunities or extracurricular activities where students can learn and sort of collaborate? And what does that look like? Sure, we're, we're just starting, and I don't know if you've ever done this, uh, I did it for the first time about a month ago, but we can be on a Zoom and then we can, someone can hit a button and we can break out into our different groups. And mm -hmm. we do that with the kids. So if you're doing a bird study unit and your bird is uh, the robin, uh, you can be with all the other kids who are studying the robin and the teacher can push a button and the kids are in their breakout groups. Um, now, breakout groups uh, with five-year-olds without any uh, adults, uh, you know, can go awry. You can pop into the Robin room and find that everybody is talking about basketball and not the Robin. Um, but uh, that's what teachers do is bring kids back and they know that they're, you know, answering a set of questions. But we actually can do group projects digitally. It takes, again, a level of organization 
and a level of planning and thoughtfulness and a, an ability to cascade. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, you have to be able to communicate with your principals and train teachers. Um, all of our training, by the way, has proceeded. So we're still training teachers. We're still training assistant principals. We still have senior leader days where we are training them because that's part and parcel of the excellent schooling. Incredible. On the art side, if you're taking an art class, like I visited a few of your campuses and have seen some incredible art projects. Are kids doing this virtually or are they actually doing art projects at home? Oh, they're actually doing art projects. I was actually just watching uh, one of our art teachers. You know, it's a little more challenging because they don't have uh, their paints and they don't have all of the supplies that we have in schools. So one of our art teachers did a how to make paint with spices and then led a, a painting class uh, uh, for the kids. So the teachers are being very, very creative, um, you know, trying to find ways that are convenient, doable, uh, but engaging for the children. That's incredible. There's a few other questions um, that, so what do you hope to take from this experience? So one-to-one -one devices was not part of the learning for K through three. Will that be part of the learning going forward? And then other things like you've been able to feature your best teachers uh, to provide the introductory or uh, lecture to a topic or providing the closing remarks to a discussion. Um, how do you plan to use these interesting learnings when you go back to school in the fall assume you were able to open uh, in a, a sort of more traditional learning way, learning environment? Well, Catherine, I think that's a really good uh, question. And it, it's, you know, it's, these times are on the one hand, uh, super difficult and can be discouraging. On the other hand, I think there are opportunities to think differently about education that it would be such a shame if we don't take advantage. I mean, sort of everybody's doing a version of homeschooling. Literally uh, 50 million uh, children are, are at home. And so, you know, we, we miss the kids and I don't think one is a total substitute for the other, but, um, you know, we will definitely be a totally digitized K to 12. And, you know, I find a lot of resistance to digitization. I did it only four to 12 because people were like, oh my God, the sky is falling. The kids won't be able to take an assessment digitally and they want to push it five years out. You know, this in one fell swoop, we're K to 12. Uh, all of our homework is digital. All kids are taking assessments uh, mm -hmm. in a digital format. And, you know, while there's noise in the system and it didn't go perfectly, it never does. And change, you know, is not uh, non-messy. We will definitely bring that uh, uh, forward. I think the other obvious learning is the parent engagement piece. I mean, we've always put a premium that it's really, really important uh, to engage parents. But the digitization and remote, um, we've had more and better communication with our parents uh, since remote learning because it's so easy to do webinars. And, you know, poor parents are stretched and stressed for them to get to the school and to um, kind of make in-person meetings. Uh, is really, really challenging. And I think that's a way in which school schooling is going to change. I think there are more radical uh, lessons or more profound lessons uh, having to do with flipped classrooms and out of school learning time that are really sort of food for thought that we must take very seriously. And we are thinking those through um, but we will be changed. Success Academy will not be the same as a result of uh, this radical event. Mm. 
So just as a quick aside, folks have been submitting questions using the Q&A feature and we're super grateful for that. So please continue to submit your questions. Uh, if donors were interested in getting a snapshot of your weekly schedule or what it looks like for your K through five, where would they find that information? Um, well, we can get that to you and we can figure out the best vehicle uh, for that. Uh, we sent it out um, sort of uh, to the list that we had, uh, which is pretty extensive, uh, tens of thousands of educators, um, but we can figure out what is the best way uh, to, to do that. That'd be great. On the Ed Institute? Is it on the Ed Institute uh, site? Um, I don't know if it's yet there. It should be there. Uh, we were having a, a little bit of a technical issue, um, but it should be there and it probably will be up in the next day or so. So perhaps that, in which case, if an individual wanted to access that, they need to create an account through the Ed Institute. But, it right, is but anyone can do that. You don't have to be any, you don't have to have any special uh, uh, anything, uh, any member of the public. No can. credit cards are needed to enter, yeah. don't worry. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> I love that. Um, but I think, so this question about earlier, you talked about connectivity and New York City was in a unique place where um, families were able to get access to internet. Um, that might be temporary, or I'm assuming it might be temporary, like 90 days of excellent connectivity, but then what happens next? In the event that you will have to continue to do a hybrid model of learning at home, maybe at school, how does that learning continue at home? How is Success Academy thinking about that? Yeah, we just get hotspots where necessary. Uh, and that is, uh, I think, nationwide a relatively easy, not certainly not no cost, uh, but a relatively low cost solution uh, to, that, uh, to that problem. And then you would just manage the contract. At least that's what I've heard other schools do. They manage spots and track it just like the devices. Yep. That's great. In the event of parents that are, you know, that are having to go back to work, how are you guys resolve or responding to those students that would have to be left at home? What does that look like when the parent goes back to work um, and then the kid stays at home to continue their learning? Yeah, I mean, look, we, we we have, uh, I mean, that is a tremendous challenge uh, and childcare in this country is a tremendous challenge. But I do want to remind people that, you know, over Christmas break, parents have to work and manage childcare over the summer uh, for large periods of time. That is still the case over spring break, over, you know, Thanksgiving week, there are many times where that happens already. And look, mm -hmm. one could argue why are the schools on the agrarian calendar? It really doesn't work for working parents. And I think that yes. is a very valid uh, question. Um, but right now, you know, that is the case. What I'm really concerned about is, you know, if this goes on for much longer, I do think it it just uh, is going to have a very serious impact on the economy, which is already in shambles. And so we gotta figure out how to get back to semi-normal as quickly as we can while being safe and putting the safety of not only children, but also uh, frontline workers, uh, we need to make sure that our teachers are not getting sick and that our principals are not getting sick. Mm. Um, so this is a, a broad uh, problem. I think we've got a balance though. There isn't a world where there is zero risk or, you know, we're, we're past that point. <laughs> um, I think people are forgetting a little bit that the social distancing was initially a response to flattening the curve, which was incredibly important that we did that. Um, but it's not a permanent solution to 
all that is going on. And so we're really going to have to pay attention to these key metrics that are not uh, the, you know, what is the pace of COVID uh, testing? What is the pace of contact tracing? How do we minimize risk um, while getting the economy back on its feet? Um, it doesn't help the children, uh, you know, if their parents have no jobs. That is creating other problems, and that is a serious issue, too. Yeah. Um, there was a question about uh, if you are a single site school and you want to sort of adapt some of the, the, the resources that you all have developed, and maybe you're K-5, maybe you're a K-8, or maybe you're a smaller K-12, um, you have economies of scale in that you have uh, 45 campuses, you're serving 18,000 students. If you were serving just a couple hundred students and you didn't have the resource of many, many different master teachers from which to pull, what advice would you give to a donor who's supporting a school that's in this sort of more intimate learning environment? Well, you know, I, I appreciate that, um, you know, we're doing this on a scale that is very different than others, but good resource allocation, if you have a little bit, you still have to allocate it really smartly and play the best hand that you uh, have been dealt. And I think we've got to be more flexible. And mm -hmm. so we tend to get into these little boxes where the seventh grade math teacher is only going to teach seventh grade math teach, you know, math. Whereas the seventh grade math teacher may need to teach seventh, eighth, and ninth if they're the best person to do that. And we may have to have larger class sizes remotely. And we might need to give that teacher more prep time because they're teaching different classes. But in our bricks and mortar world, everybody is in like a little box and mm -hmm. we don't really break those rules. And the pandemic and the social distancing and the shutdown of schools really force us to think, okay, we, were, we don't have perfect. That's not an option. Option A, we don't have anymore. What is the best option B given our limited resources so that we optimize learning for children? And having um, facility at not only asking those questions, but worrying less about how those decisions are going to land. Because often the reason the leader doesn't want to do that is they're worried, well, are the teachers going to be upset? Are the principal, everybody is a creature of habit. And you've got to kind of bring everybody along to say, why we're reallocating resources. And if the answer is children, not ego, not anything else, if the answer is children and teaching and learning, I think leaders would be surprised at how many people are gonna follow them if that is the reason. Like we didn't really have trouble with the resource allocation because we explained the why and everybody was on board to do right by the kids. That's great. One um, last question, and unfortunately, this is a sort of a not a, as uplifting as I would like. Um, but what about issues related to child abuse? You mentioned that you have your counselors uh, ready to serve your students um, and sort of intervene if necessary. But how how have you all been able to manage um, those difficult types of um, home environments? Yeah, and child abuse is, is a really difficult subject and um, one that perhaps educators don't speak enough about, but it, it certainly exists when we're in our brick and mortar world. And that is something that uh, we are very, very concerned about, first and foremost, protecting the safety of the child. In this remote context, in some ways, um, it, um, it's interesting because we are sometimes seeing on video uh, indicators that we wouldn't ordinarily see. Uh, 
because we're in the living rooms, we're in the homes. And so we have very specific protocols if we see something concerning uh, and are very, very aggressive about protecting uh, children. And so um, we actually have more visibility in some ways than we had in a bricks and mortar world. Hmm. Okay, I wanna flip it last to a more joyful thing. And then Susie, any last questions or um, comments I would love to hear from you. But Eva, like, what have you been most surprised by? Like what has been like a real, you, you pride yourself in creating joyful learning environments. Has there been anything really exciting that you all have taken away from this experience, given that you have 18,000 kids learning all across New York? Um, New York City specifically? Well, I think what I've been most proud of is sort of the love and the joy. Um, and of course, there's reading, writing, and mathematics. But I think what is special about Success Academy is just uh, the love and commitment and relationships that we have with our kids and families. And so I've been, you know, as the leader of success, I thought everybody would step up. Um, and not only did they step up, but they went beyond my, you know, kind of vision of what this could be like. I, I recently, we, we, uh, we administered the AP exams digitally, which was incredibly nerve wracking because uh, we didn't know if the tech was going to work. We didn't know, we're unfamiliar with this format. And the kids, um, you know, sent these just amazing texts to their teachers and to the principal saying, you know, I was so proud of the essay I wrote. I've never written an essay that is that good. And oh. you held my hand every step of the way and I couldn't have done it uh, without you. And just the sort of, um, kind of enthusiasm that uh, our teachers um, exhibited. I think in terms of surprise, it's a little bit related to your question. You know, I'm very familiar with the level of dedication that we have at SA and you can sort of start to take it for granted and you kind of assume that our parents get it. The thing that was surprising because we are not only sort of beaming into their homes, but our parents are seeing instruction end to end for many hours a day. And they have been just so pleased with the quality of education. And I think, honestly, didn't know that that's what we had been doing all along and didn't honestly know how hard it is to be a really good teacher. If you are really dedicated to your students and you are reading all of their writing and you are giving them feedback and you are there in the morning, midday, in the afternoon, frankly, on weekends, on evenings, in evenings, our parents sort of saw that in a way that they actually haven't, even though we've been doing that for 14 years and they were so appreciative of it that it also kind of lifted everyone's spirits in a rather dark time. So that was really wonderful. Mm. I just have one quick question, Eva. Uh, looking ahead and, and uh, anticipating a budget crisis in Albany, um, what are you predicting and what are you preparing for? What are you planning for? Sure, I'm really glad you asked that question, Susie, because um, I, I wouldn't want to leave anyone with the impression that we're sort of clicking our heels and skipping around. Um, the, the, the circumstances are really dire, uh, and I'm sure it's in many parts of the country, but obviously New York has been particularly hard hit. Uh, we've already gotten a budget cut. We expect uh, many more. Um, you know, this is also a context in which, you know, it's nerve wracking. We're so grateful for the philanthropy that we've received, but we have emergency expenses that we never had before and we're getting budget cuts. So navigating that um, is difficult and stressful. Um, you should know that I have taken immediate steps to kind of reduce all unnecessary expenditures, non-essential 
um, and want to have as much liquidity as possible to navigate all this. Um, but we are going to need help uh, for our most vulnerable students. Um, you know, they don't have the luxury of, um, you know, having educated, super educated parents uh, fill in for them. You know, we serve a low income first generation. Uh, most of our kids' parents have not gone to college. And so for them to navigate this journey in the midst of a pandemic, with an economic uh, meltdown is really, really challenging. So we're gonna continue to need help and support. And what we can do from our end is promise that we are gonna do everything in our power to deliver world-class education uh, for kids and to support our families. But it's going to be a challenging couple of years at least. Well, keep it up. Uh, Zoom applause, as they say, and uh, thank you for, for your time, Ava. Thanks for enlightening us on, on many things that we were really curious about. Thank you, Susie. Thank you, Catherine and the Philanthropy Roundtable. It's really been a pleasure uh, to have this dialogue. Thank you so much. We're grateful to you, Susie. Grateful to you, Eva. And on behalf of my colleagues, Pat and Tori and Mary Margaret, we are so grateful you could join us today. We will send a recap with many of the information that you all inquired about, and we will have this recording on our website, if not by the end of tomorrow, by Monday. So thank you all. Have a really great weekend. Please stay safe and healthy and uh, know we are at your service. Thanks again.